uh, no problem. Shouldn't be any problems at all. A little nippy, but other than that, no problem. Let's send it back down for more of the football pregame show with Kate and Carson. Thank you, Barry and Walt. We'll be back to you for kickoff in just a few minutes. Now it is time for our weekly look at the league standings for football, volleyball, softball, and men's soccer. In the 3A Southern League, the Classical Academy, Pueblo East, and Pueblo County all won their league openers. Only two teams will be on the top after Week 7 as TCA hosts Pueblo East, while Pueblo County will battle Pueblo Central. In the 3A South Central League, Coronado marches an, uh, on undefeated after last week's mashing of Mitchell 50-6. to six. Cor er, Discovery Canyon beat Lewis Palmer to remain tied in league play and one, and one game back of the Cougars overall. Coronado plays at Discovery Canyon Week 10. In the 4A Pikes Peak League, things are getting interesting. Ponderosa and Pine Creek are tied at 3-0 in league with Falcon and Sand Creek one game back at 2-1. Sand Creek faces Pine Creek and Falcon faces Ponderosa. Sand Creek and Falcon must win in order to create a four-way tie atop the league with three weeks remaining. In the 4A Foothills League, the Pueblo South Colts are leading by a neck overall, or over four teams as they get ready to battle Canyon City. Palmer Ridge faces Pueblo West, which will create additional separation within the standings. The 5A Pioneer League was busy last night as Fountain Fort Carson escaped its game with Castleview with a 19-17 win and remains in first place. Legend and Rock Canyon also posted league victories and Doherty will play Valor Christian in a non-league tilt. Taking it to the court, the latest volleyball standing show, the 4A Pikes Peak League, is being led by the Lewis Palmer Rangers and the five-time defending state champion Indians of Cheyenne Mountain. They go head-to-head -head on the 15th of October to settle the league title. As the 4A CSML tournament begins, Coronado hosts the second through fourth place teams for the league title. They began with Mitchell, then will face Woodland Park, and conclude league play next Thursday with Mesa Ridge. Winning the league title would give them an automatic berth and a top seed in the regional tournament. The defending state champion Doherty Spartans dispatched a scrappy Palmer squad last night to remain atop the 5A Colorado Springs Metro League. Rampart's lone league loss is to Doherty as they remain in second, fending off Pine Creek. In a scheduling change, we will have Liberty versus Doherty next Thursday night here on the District 11 channel. Making our way now to the diamond for girls softball, Woodland Park as a 21 seed and Whitefield as a 30 seed secured spots in the regional tournament, which, now, which begins tomorrow at eight sites around the state. Woodland Park faces Thompson Valley and Whitefield faces Ponderosa. The 4A Pikes Peak League sends four teams into the regional brackets. League champion Discovery Canyon, Air Academy, Falcon, and Palmer Ridge all have, to ch uh, have a chance to advance to the state tournament. In the 5A Colorado Springs Metro League, Pine Creek won the league title and adv advances to regionals as a number 15 seed. They will be joined by Rampart as the Rams secured the number 17 seed. Now we make our way to the pitch for men's soccer, where Mitchell, who earns an automatic berth to the state playoffs, won the 4A Colorado Springs Metro League. Widefield will join them. Harrison is on the bubble, waiting until the October 20th tournament seeding meeting. The first round begins October 23rd and 24th, with the finals November 9th. And the 4A Pikes Peak League Air Academy remains perfect on the season with two games to go. Cheyenne Mountain finishes second and earned a berth in the state tournament. The Cadets and Indians have allowed just 9 and 10 goals against, respectively, on the season. In the 5A Colorado Springs Metro League, Pine Creek needs to defeat Rampart next week to claim the league title outright and secure the automatic berth to state. Doherty and Liberty play next week with the winner improving their chances of joining the Eagles. Time now for a quick break. When we come back, we will be joined by our special guest, the 4A state golf champion, Isaac Petersili from Coronado High School. You're watching the District 11 High School football pregame show on the District 11 channel.
to the District 11 High School Football Pre-Game Show here at Gary Berry Stadium. It is my pleasure now to be joined by the 4A State Golf Champion, Isaac Peter Seeley. Thank you for joining us tonight. As a sophomore, you are one of the youngest champions ever. When did you begin playing golf? Um, I began about five years ago. Um, this kind of started up in middle school and just really found a love for the game. I've also been inspired by my coach Ty Thompson, um, all our coaches from the golf team, a lot of my friends, and just um, just the game brings me a lot of joy, so just keep playing. Excellent. During the championship, what was the greatest stress in the final round? Um, the greatest stress was probably knowing that one's little slip up could cost you the title, but then maybe one putt dropping could earn you the title. Also the coaches just pushing me and then just being there was also comforting and also my friends being right there was very comforting and just the atmosphere of all the people watching just made you hone in and it was just a great experience. Great. Is there any downtime during the winter? Um, there's a little downtime but for the most part it's just uh, playing every weekend and then getting a little practice in. Thank you for joining us tonight. Let's go down to the field now as referee George Dimitriou has assembled the Camptons for the coin toss. Barnado has won the toss and has chosen to defer. Tonight's game. When we come back, we will t take it to the booth for kickoff of tonight's game. Uh, our time is up. Thank you for tuning in to the District 11 pregame show. I'm Carson Christell here with Kate Sicula. Sicula, high school football, er, high school football straight ahead here on the District 11 channel. Welcome everybody to Gary Berry Stadium. Another Friday night for football. A little bit of rain earlier. The track is what for the cheerleaders. We will see just how the drainage on this football field took shape with the new turf that was put down. Barry Reed, Walter Johnson ready to bring you all the action tonight here from Gary Berry Stadium. Week 7, Coronado comes in 7-0 as they played a zero-week game. Lewis Palmer comes in two and five as they had a zero-week game as well. Lewis Palmer gets a bye next week. 
So hoping to grab a win here against the Cougars in the series, as you heard on the pregame show, that they control 6-3 to three over the course of the years. And we are about ready to get underway, Walt Johnson. And Coronado will kick off, Barry, and I think this is a different Cougar team than these Rangers are, are used to seeing. I am looking so forward to watching this team. I'm still getting over that stat from last week. One pass incomplete, but they were able to put 50 points up on Mitchell running the football. Grabbing the kickoff and heading upfield for Lewis Palmer. And the Rangers will start at their own 26-yard line with a first and 10. Tillotson gives off up the middle to Brines on the first carry of the game. It's going to be a gain of just one for Matt Brines, who comes in with 355 yards and five touchdowns. Actually moved to the fullback position from the slot receiver due to the injury. And Brines has it a second time, and he is out close to the 35, they'll spot him at the 33-yard line. It'll bring up a third and four for Lewis Palmer. Brian Timms with the kickoff return for the Rangers. Sophomore Paul Tilson and whistles blow this one dead. We will wait the official word from George Demetrio. So Walt, the first penalty of the night will back the Rangers up five and bring us to a third and eight situation. I'd like to take this opportunity now to thank Louie and all the folks at Louie's Pizza for providing dinner for the student volunteers and production staff bringing you tonight's broadcast. Louie's Pizza is a longtime supporter of School District 11. Call one of Louie's five locations to find out more about their straight A program rewarding your students with free pizza for their academic success. Tillotson back with the first pass of the night down the left-hand side and a reaching grab. He was out of bounds when he came down. Out there for Jonathan Scott, the 6'2 sophomore wide receiver and younger brother of Josh and Jordan Scott. But it will be incomplete, bringing up a fourth and eight for the Rangers. You'll see Mr. Scott. Nick Chorney back to do the punting duties for Lewis Palmer. Austin Nietzsche back for Coronado. It is a blackout night for the Coronado Cougars. They're in black from head to toe with the yellow numbers. And this kick will roll out of bounds at the 43 from Chorney. So that is where the Cougars will start on offense for the first time this evening. The offense for the Cougars, Joe Smith, the 6'2 senior quarterback, 200 pounds, 768 yards on the, through the air, 140 yards on the ground with five touchdowns. He'll start in the shotgun. Fake the give to Michi. Actually gave it to Michi around the right-hand side. Good ball handling, but that is going to be a loss of one as the Rangers were ready for that play. It'll be second and 11 for the Cougars. One of the things that you find is that there's pretty good scouting going on right now. Looks like Lewis Palmer had that play diagnosed very well. Max Wyman in the general vicinity for the Rangers. Now the first pass of the night out into the flat and ahead for a good game across midfield to the 48. So that'll be a gain of eight. Eight. <laughs> 
And Michi with the reception. Or check that, that was Richard Ito, the Z back in that formation. And I do apologize that the yellow highlight numerals on Coronado are going to be a little tough to see. Coming around, keeper for Joe Smith. Actually, he gave it off. First man off the right-hand side. I can already see we're going to have trouble with the ball handling skills of the senior quarterback. <laughs> yeah, Gain of one on the play. It's going to make it fourth and one. Yeah, Campbell is short on that one. Uh, first uh, decision of the night, and uh, looks like Coronado is going to actually go for it here, partner. Joe Smith came to the sidelines talking to his offensive coordinator and now back into the huddle. Wing to the right, Duval deep in the eye. And there is encroachment on the Rangers and the free first down for Coronado. Oh, and he, and he knew it right away, too. He, he, he's, he knew he made a play that he didn't want to make. Brad Ellis, the linebacker coming around, coming across. Would have been interesting to see what uh, Coronado would have run on that play, partner, and see if they can get that first down. Slide Sam Smith across the right of the formation and hand it off to the left-hand side behind him. And it will be a gain to the 40-yard line. Pick up of three on the play for the Cougars. We had a last-minute change on the offensive line on the left side for Coronado. Julian Fouché, number 75, gets the start. Fouché, a 6'4", 280-pound junior. Sam Smith comes around in motion. The pitch back to Duval, and he will be met and thrown back by this defense. Richard Ito, the outside linebacker. For Lewis Palmer, comes up to make the hit. Loss of about half a yard on the play. We'll call it third and eight for the Cougars. This is our first time seeing Coronado this year, partner. And I'll tell you one, one thing that impresses me already, the number of players down there on that Cougar sideline. This might be the most I've seen in a couple of years. Most of this group of seniors were freshmen when Coronado suffered through, and this is Ito with the sack getting through. He'll throw Joe Smith back down at the other side of the 50, the loss of 10 on the sack, and that is the first sack of the year for Richard Ito. So the scouting for Lewis Palmer has found something they like on that side of the line, and they have had good pressure a couple of times on Joe Smith. Came right off that edge, partner, and almost came in unblocked. Tim's back to receive the punt. Calls for the fair catch at the 22-yard line. He will gather it in there. Tyler Geske, the 5'8 senior with the punt there. So each team has had their first possession. We have seen two punts, but a first down for Coronado. And now Lewis Palmer takes over on their own 23. That play is going to go nowhere, partner. Swarming defense by the Cougars will actually cost Lewis Palmer a yard. And it will be second and 11. It looks like they're winning the battle on the interior. Coronado is uh, winning that battle on the interior so far. Two receivers right, slot to the left, and the cross, oh, nice crossing pass. pattern is complete. And shaking a tackle down the sideline before he's finally run out of bounds there by Austin Michi with the reception for the Rangers. Nick Christensen. That is 
the senior, Nick Christensen, 5'11", 165. So the first, first down for the Rangers. Very nicely designed play, too. Part. They let Christensen come up underneath all the traffic that was in the area. Ito in motion, give it off to Brines up the middle, and he is going to be swarmed under. Fouché was there for Coronado. I checked that, that was Andrew Brown, the senior. Check that one more time. I'm getting my rosters here mixed up. <laughs> that was Bo Beatty, who was supposed to be the one starting on the offensive tackle before Fouché took his place. Mm -hmm. Second and nine for Lewis Palmer after the gain of one. In motion and uh, straight up the middle. It's going to be a gain of two down to the 44-yard line. Bring up a third and six. Tillotson uh, did not hand off that time. I guess his read was to go ahead and keep the football. Two receivers left, single back. Tillotson back, throws it down the oh, seam. Yeah, we're we going to have a flag yeah. coming out. The intended receiver was Scott. <laughs> but Jonathan Scott was interfered with down there. Back in coverage for Coronado was the linebacker, Sam Smith. Yeah, that was a mugging. <laughs> he held on and uh, didn't let Scott get to that football. Smith had outside position on Scott, and the pass went a little more outside. And Smith didn't gave Scott no opportunity to get to back to the outside. George Demetrio with the call. I think what they were discussing, it took, it took a while to get this one done. They were discussing whether it was going to be holding or whether it was going to be pass interference, and they uh, settled on the pass interference call. Ball spotted at the 29-yard line of the Cougars. Obviously gives Lewis Palmer a big first down. Slot to the right, Tim's in motion. And the inside give to Ito, and he is going to be smothered. Knifing through to make the tackle. That is Ryan Strabala, the 6'2", 220-pound sophomore. Yeah, let's watch this again, partner. Now, he's going to come from the right side of your screen, folks. They, they made it look like it was going to be. Well, this is the pass, actually. That's the pass interference, actually. And you saw the holding there. But it's going to make it look like it's, uh, it was a pass, and they went to the run. Live action. Give it straight up the middle to Brines. And it will be a short gain. He'll get back to the original line of scrimmage, picking up the two lost on the previous play. And it will bring up third and 10. Ball resting on the 29-yard line. New look to the Coronado helmets. Like that helmet. <laughs> Got the little claw tear yeah. through the red paint. Mm -hmm. Instead of the interlocking CC yeah. or the Cougar head that we have seen the last couple like of that. years. Not sure I like the black on black with the black numbers, though. I don't think I care for that too much. Tight end right, give motion. Brines right up the middle, and he is going to be smothered. With the tackle for Coronado, that is Joseph Hunt. And it'll be a short game, bring up fourth and eight for Lewis Palmer. And in this area of the field, you're obviously going to go for it. Ball spotted on the 27. It would be a 44-yard field goal attempt. No too long for that, I think. And you certainly don't want to punt. Uh, they'll only give you a net of eight yards if it goes into the end zone. So uh, why not? Cody Anderson, the 5'10 senior, comes in with the play for Lewis Palmer. They'll set a tight end to the right, two receivers to the left. Bring the slot in motion, and it'll be a keeper for Tillotson. Sam Smith, the second hit, the first hit by Zeb Foster. The second leading tackler, Smith and Foster, one and two in tackles from their linebacker positions. So turned over on downs do the Rangers, and Coronado will take over at its own 22 after the turnover. But advantage Rangers, because they've just turned the field back over. 
So now Coronado is going to let's see if the Coronado offense can get that field position back that they gave up when they couldn't move it on that last drive. I formation run off the left-hand side out for a gain of two, just shy of the 25-yard line. With the carry for Coronado is Colt Nixon, the six-foot sophomore. Junior York splits wide out to the right. Eye formation, give off the left-hand side. Lowering his shoulder, running hard with the carry. Is Austin Michi, the 5'8 junior. And that's the thing. You've got the Smith twins, Sam and Joa, who are seniors, part of this senior class, but you've got guys like Michi and Duvall that are a big part of this offense that are still just juniors. And will be around next year. That, that's right. Coronado, three, third straight play off that left-hand side. And it will be a short gain bringing up fourth down. So both of these defenses winning the battles early here. We've got a minute left in quarter number one. And we are about to see our third punt. Chandler Folks, the 5'10 junior, on to do the kicking duties. Oh, good kick. Fair catch called for. Oh, that's a and we've got a flag on the play as there were four Cougars that came down and settled in front of the receiver. But then the receiver runs up into the middle of that pack. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I'll tell you but what. the flag will fly. The call is going to be a fair, kick, fair catch interference because the receiver did not have a chance to catch the football. And even though it hit the Lewis Palmer player, you still have to give the punt returner, once he gives that fair catch signal, the opportunity to make the catch, and they crowded him and did not give him that opportunity. A lengthy discussion now. Let's see what George, well, George Dimitro is talking to the Coronado coaches now. Bob Lizarraga looking for an explanation mm -hmm. as his guys had, to their own credit, had stopped and created a cup wall, uh, mm -hmm. almost a pocket in reverse, mm -hmm. the ball came behind them. That's not their fault. Or the ball came actually right on top of them. And in all fairness to George Dimitrio and his crew, I think that's one they're going to want to look at on the tape. Well, but I'll tell you why, they, why they're going to be okay with the call. Here, here's, here's the thing. When the punt is in the air and the receiver asks for a fair catch, the onus is on the defense at that point to give him room. So even though they stopped and made that cup, and I'll get that to back to that after this play, Father. Tillotson back under center. It'll be option to the right. Brines with some speed. Again, he went for 80 last week. Here he's close to a 10-yard gain around the left-hand side as he was able to outrun Zeb Foster. And we're coming up close to the end of the quarter. I'll get to that in a second. And it will be a first down. Just straight option left. Yeah. And he made the right call on that one because the Coronado defense pinched down on him, leaving that outside open. Junior York with the open field tackle. Second man around is Zito and flags flying. Coronado coaches still a buzz <laughs> from that penalty on the punt. Uh, yelling for the holding call, and uh, looks like they are going to get that one. They'll be a little happy with this call. <laughs> this first quarter has flown by. We are down to 22 seconds. Not a lot of passing, a whole lot of running, which means the clock is going on. Two fouls on the play. Both are on Lewis Palmer. We have holding on number 61. That penalty is declined. We have holding on number 56. That penalty is accepted. Ten yards from the spot of the foul. We're going to repeat first down. So the flag was at the 30-yard line. They'll mark the 10 from there. So basically a 13-yard penalty marked off against Lewis Palmer, and it will be first and 23 now. So a bit of a break as Lewis Palmer started in Coronado territory, emphasizing your point of turning the field on their last drive. 
Two receivers left. The man in motion to the near side. And Coronado does a great job of stringing it out. And there is Sam Smith, the linebacker, losing his helmet on the tackle. Will have to come out for a play while he gets his chin strap back on. But it's going to be a loss of five on the play. And for Smith, came in the leading quarter. tackler with 70 tackles, 40 solo. One sack and one interception. And a big loss of yardage right there. Folks, watch over here, right here. There you, there you see the helmet flying off. But that's how you play defense against an option team. You get up the field and get ready to make a tackle. Now, while we got a second, let me uh, see if I can go back, partner, and try to explain that uh, fair catch penalty and why George Mitchell and his guys may be okay with it. Once the kick is in the air, it is the onus of the defense to allow the, the player to make the catch. Even if that player has to come up to make the catch or go back to make the catch, once he gives the fair catch signal, it would be different if he had not given a fair catch signal. That's why even though they put that pocket around and were in guarding positions, uh, for want of a better term, that was still the right call, I, in my opinion, uh, to make on that play. If you were on the field, let me ask you it this way. Would you have considered that a no call? Probably not, to be honest with you. Probably not, to be honest with you. Because, and, and, and the key for me, partner, is the fact that he put the hand up for the fair catch. So at that point, uh, you, you teach your kids on special teams, once that fair catch signal goes up, make sure the kid has a chance to make the catch. That's the most important thing. So we've switched ends of the field. Lewis Palmer now moving south to north here at Gary Berry Stadium. Lewis Palmer in the white with the black helmets. Coronado in the black with the red helmets. Tillotson back and pressure coming. York in coverage down the side. And a great reach up and pass defense by Junior York. Wow. <laughs> York has one interception on the year, but great pass coverage there. Denying the Rangers, and it will be third and 28 as the Rangers need to get to the 18 for the first down. Outstanding coverage on that play. I'm not sure if I've ever seen coverage at that well. Now watch this ball that's thrown in the air, folks. Now watch on the left side of your screen. Watch. He's running, running, looking back for the football. Nice play. Oh, Austin Michi almost had the interception as we were at the replay hit him in his hands he could not haul it in he had a lot of real estate out in front of him watch you this. can see him re running out to the right of your screen for the coverage and if he catches this football the only thing that's going to tackle him is that green grass there was actually no one from Lewis Palmer in a position to catch him and he uh, caught that football in formation for Lewis Palmer. Tillotson is the up man, but it comes through. And the kick is away, angled, and now bouncing towards the center, and it's going to take a good roll for Lewis Palmer. Excellent punt. It will be recorded as a 44-yard punt down at the one. So Nick Chorney, the six-foot sophomore, downing one inside the, not only inside the 20, but inside the five. Um, I might be inside the two, just Maybe inside the two. At the one. Wow. <laughs> so Chorney does a great job of, again, turning the field. Mm -hmm. And now Coronado working out of its own end zone. Oh, my. And they will go double tight end power eye. Joe Smith looked to have a keeper straight up the middle, and he's going to bull his way out to about the seven-yard line. Pickup of six on the play. Well, that's the way to do it. Why hand it off and risk a fumble down there? Just let your quarterback uh, get the ball and get upfield and see what he can get for you. And that was a pretty nice run there. Joe Smith, 55 carries coming into the ball game. This gives you a little more options uh, to be an off your goal line. Power eye formation. Give it to Duval off the right-hand side. He's going to be close to the 10. Will be a gain of two and bring up a third and one. A 
Here's Zito Smith. You can see how chilly it is down there tonight when the players can see their breath through the face masks. A little nippy down there tonight. That time of the year. Cougars stay in the power eye with their backs against the goal line. Give off to Duvall on the right-hand side. And he is going to be brought down close to the 11-yard line, which was the line they needed for the first down. I, th I think he got it. They will spot him at the 12. First down for the Cougars. And in the first three possessions for Coronado, we have seen multiple formations trying to, one, work their offense, get something started, find out what they're going to be able to get yeah. off of Lewis Palmer and then stick with it. But right there, Power Eye, good formation to use when you're backed up. And give the Rangers some credit, probably. They did a good job of stringing out the plays. Five-man front. Joe Smith looking for his first pass. Out on the side, oh, nice he has this. York. And that will be complete to Junior York, his 10th reception on the year. This will be good all the way out to the 32-yard line. So a gain of 20 on the pitch and catch. Folks, I want you to watch. Watch the feet right there. Oh, that's pretty. That's pretty. Got the first one down, and in high school, you only need to get one down. So first down for the Cougars, and now finally some room to operate. And here's a lot of room to operate. With the carry, Isaiah Duval, a 6'1 junior. Came into the night just under 100 carries, averaging over seven yards a carry, and this is going to be ahead for a first down. Ball spotted at the 45 yard line, pickup of 13. Slot right is Sam Smith. He'll Take his route out into the flat. Now cut it back after the reception. <coughs> and he'll be inside the 40-yard line. Gain of 16 on the play. The hookup between Joa and Sam Smith. Smith had 19 receptions for 308 yards coming in and a couple of touchdowns. Just a real simple out pattern here to Smith. And once he catches the ball, he makes a nice move. I'll call that the West Welker move to get upfield and get it a few more yards. Smith comes in, goes back in motion now, give off to Duval. Some shifty running and finding a seam down to the 31 yard line. So a pickup of eight, it'll bring up a second and two. And now this Cougar offense, which started this drive at the one, starting to crank some things out, finding a little bit of rhythm. Put it in gear a little bit. Ooh. First man through with it is Zeb Foster. And the six-foot junior will take it ahead for the first down down to the 26-yard, 27-yard line. Well, he was a, a ankle tackle away from us having a little bit of excitement, too. Zeb Foster's longest run of the year, 22 yards. He does have five touchdowns. This time he leads it up into the hole for Duval, and Duval will get down to the 25 for a gain of two. Bring up a second and 10. All black uniforms for Coronado on blackout night. Mm -hmm. John Fisher, the junior, split far out to the right. That one intended for Sam Smith on the tight post, but a good job of knif knifing across the pass by Christian Abatello, the 6'1 senior. Yeah, he, he wants that, to throw this thing in here, partner, but he uh, had to put a little too much mustard on it, and uh, he couldn't, couldn't catch that one. Abatello causing just of enough of a distraction. Now Foster... Comes back into the ball game, switching with Colt Dixon, the six foot sophomore. Rangers showing blitz, and here they come. 
Joe Smith out now. He's going to throw it down the seam and overthrow the intended receiver, Sam Smith. Over the top coverage there by Brian Timms. Christensen had the underneath coverage for the Rangers. But Coronado taking a shot on third and eight. Now bring up a fourth and eight ball at the 25. And they'll go, well, obviously, it is two down territory. But I like the fact that you're going to have a timeout here. Bob Luce Raga wants to talk about this. Timeout taken by Coronado. We have seen, we have seen uh, Sam Smith tonight being the, one of the main targets for his brother. I had a chance to sit down with Sam and Noah earlier. Guys, if we can run video number one. This is part of my conversation with Sam and Joe Smith. So sitting here with Sam and Joe Smith, guys, fourth year at Coronado, freshman year, the varsity goes 0-10. Uh, do you remember what you guys were doing as freshmen at that time? Well, I remember, I know, I know I was trying to just kind of play as hard as I could. And after that season was over, I looked back and I just thought, you know, I'm going to work as hard as I can. So my senior year, I know that it doesn't happen and we don't go 0-10 for me because that's just something I didn't want. You know, it's not it's not just us, but we've I know me and Joe have worked as hard as we can to make sure, you know, that we we improve from that 0 and 10. And then we we got great coaches in here that really help us and help develop this team this year and just get us to work our hardest and play our hardest. While we are away, the Cougars got a playoff. The pass was intended for Junior York. There is a penalty on the on Cody Anderson of Lewis Palmer for a hit on a defensive defenseless receiver. Take a look at the replay. Look at the bottom right of your screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ball was overflown, overthrown, and then Cody Anderson just lays out Junior York, and York is down on the field. Yeah, very easy call for the officials to make. Uh, no one on the uh, Lewis Palmer side had too much of an issue with it. But, uh, we'll see about the young man now and uh, see if he'll be okay. But that is going to give Coronado a first down. And you see York sitting up now talking to his coaches. Personal foul, number 11 on Lewis Palmer. It's half the distance to the goal, first down. They called that on Brian Timms and not Cody Anderson. 11, not 21. They have a great sign right there. So. And Junior York, the 5'10 junior, getting up and, and coming off to the sideline under his own power, a great sign. Mm -hmm. and, and the big thing with a hit like that, part is this is the surprise of it. That's the first initial thing you have to get over. Then you want to check and make sure all the pieces are still together, so to speak. But I, I think that, might, that one might have been the win knocked out of him, and hopefully that's all that was because uh, that will certainly get him back into the football game if that's what it was. The ball was at the 26, so half the distance should take it to the 13, and we have not yet moved the chains, and that's why we have a stoppage of play here. And this gives us an opportunity to let you know that if you'd like to own a copy of this or any of the broadcasts we bring you here on the District 11 channel, three ways for you to get it, by email at channel16 at d11.org, by phone at 520-2269, or you can order online at d11.org. In the bottom of the home page, there is a quick link for District 11 on TV. The upper left-hand side, you will see the order form tab. $3 for a DVD. Also, where the order form tab is, is our streaming tab mm -hmm. for out-of-town relatives mm -hmm. who might be able to watch via the Internet. And also, our schedule tab, so you can see when we will be replaying all of our events here on the District 11 channel including a fantastic volleyball match between Doherty and Palmer that was held last night, which will play over the course of the weekend. That was a fun one to watch. Fun one, yes. Smith back. He'll roll out to his left in a little bit of trouble. The crossing, crossing man was Sam Smith at the one. And he let him just a little bit too much. Had him dragging, but good pressure upfield by the outside of the Rangers defense. Rangers defense is getting, getting, a little, getting a little stingy now and now. Just, just get close to that goal line. Defense is getting a little more, uh, uh, get their hair up a little bit more, so to speak. Watch the, this, this pass will come out in, in this area here, folks. You see, just a tad bit long. 
couldn't get to the uh, ball in front. A couple steps behind. Nike Sumler split far to the left in this formation. Sam Smith comes in motion. Pitch back to the ball around the left-hand side in the big scene. Inside the five, we've got a flag behind the play. This one might be coming back. But Duvall is brought down at the three. Yeah, I tell you what, partner, it is coming back. <laughs> but uh, a, a, a very nicely designed play. Watch him coming out here. Uh, Duvall's got all kind Holding of room to run. But number 75 uh, offense, 10-yard penalty from the start of the foul. Repeat second down. As you just heard George Dimitro say, uh, uh, they'll go bring that one back. So 7.32 left to go in the second quarter here from Gary Berry Stadium. Both teams starting to mount a little bit of offense now, but nobody able to sustain anything across the wide yellow line here. Nobody's cracked that scoreboard yet. <laughs> and I expected a little bit of offensive fireworks out here tonight. The defenses have showed up. 4-4 defense now. As, and a big hole for Duval. Isaiah Duvall inside the 10, down to the nine yard line. And that is going to make it a more manageable third and five for the Cougars. Yeah, but look at the big hole that opened up for him there, partner. And again, another shoestring tackle that brought him to the turf where he may have challenged for the end zone. Fouché, Afumagu, K, Medellin, and Aikens, the front for the Cougars, pushing their weight around. This one out into the flat, ahead for the first down and into the end zone. For the touchdown, that is Austin Michi with the reception. This is set up real nice, folks. Watch out here. They're going to throw the ball out there, and then there's going to be a block. Well, we don't see the block in the uh, screen. But a nice block out there that got Michi into the end zone. Nine yards on the catch and run for Michi. That is the 10th touchdown for Joe Smith through the air. The extra point is up and good. And the Coronado Cougars with 6.50 left to go before half take the 7-0 lead over Lewis Palmer. Well, the offense took a little bit of time to get here, partner. A quarter and a half have been played. But it finally showed up, and it showed up for the Cougars. They haven't put that extra point up for the Cougars yet. Uh, what, did they miss it? They had it up moments ago. We'll have to. Now it's... Uh... Check and see, they've dropped it back to six. Yeah. Oh, penalty. Oh, was there a penalty? Must Coronado is looking to try once again. Yeah, it must have been a penalty. So we'll, we'll try it again. <laughs> if at first you don't succeed. Special teams for Coronado. Must have been motion Coronado. They'll back him up five. The kick comes from the 15, and it is up and good, and now it is 7-0 in favor of the Cougars. Mason T. Lander, the 5'8 senior, gave up soccer to concentrate on football and be part of this football experience with his friends, and he is having a fantastic season. Well, uh... I'll reserve my editorial opinion for that. Uh, you, if you were able to be in the booth right now, you'd see a thumbs up. <laughs> if you're going to pick football over soccer, then you, you have all automatically made my good list. <laughs> Coronado goes 99 yards for the first punt or first points of the game. Now this kick by T. Lander is going to be taken. Inside the 10, spun around and dropped there is Brian Timms with the return. He makes it only back to the 17-yard line. And that is where Lewis Palmer will start. That is the worst starting field position for Lewis Palmer on the night. Now let's see if this Coronado defense can turn up the heat.
Nelson, three receivers out to the left of the formation. And they'll give it off to the right to Brines, and Brines will be ahead for a couple out to the 20. It will be second and eight from there. But we mentioned Jonathan Scott earlier, brother of Josh and Jordan. Mm -hmm. Well, the other Scott brother, Joe, is there. The 6'2", 195-pound junior, he is playing left tackle tonight. Motion comes across. Quickly out is Tillotson, and it's going to be a little bit too hot intended. In the flat for Nick Christensen, the 5'11 senior, unable to make the play. Watch uh, when he comes here, part, he's going to try to throw out here. But just a little bit too high and off the fingertips. It's going to bring up a third and eight. Ball on the 20. Midway through quarter number two here at Gary Berry Stadium. The Cougars and the Rangers in a 3A South Central League tilt. And this one, Tillotson changed his mind, had a short crossing route as the pass. But Cody Anderson ran a little too tight. I think the ball actually hit off one of the officials. And that will bring up fourth and eight for Lewis Palmer. Michi back stands at the midfield stripe, awaiting the punt of Nick Chorney. A little bit high on Chorney, but Chorney gets a foot into it. And it takes a Lewis Palmer bounce once again. And that bounce and roll is going to turn into an extra 15 for the Rangers. The Cougars will start with it at the 35-yard line, leading 7-0 here in the second quarter. 5.48 left to go. And we'll see if the Coronado offense now, Barry, can sustain the momentum from that drive that they just had, that, they, that scored. Coronado, three possessions, two punts, and a touchdown. They have it for the fourth time. Spread formation. Joe Smith with the read option keeper, and he breaks the tackle. And he's going to be ahead out across the 45 for a Coronado first down. Well, maybe so they he... will move the chains and the Coronado momentum. Maybe it took those first two drives to get the engine fired up. Mm -hmm. And against this bunch of Lewis Palmer Rangers, punting is very dangerous. If you look across the defensive front, Wyman, Logason, and Johnson all have blocked punts on the season. Ooh. That's a nice stat I to have. I believe they've got five blocked punts as a team. Now trips to the right. The pitch out to Duvall. Duvall finds a cutback seam up the, up the left side. And he will be brought down at the 35. Call it a gain of 24. And a first down. Watch the cutback lane he has right there. And then he finds another lane in here. Nice run. Just nice running by Duvall. So first and 10 Cougars from the 35-yard line. They'll split three off to the right again. And it's out in the flats to Austin Michi, and Michi cannot come up with it. He was the inside receiver in that three-receiver set. So the other two receivers were downfield blocking for him. Take a look at it again. He just couldn't haul it in. Right off the hands. He just couldn't get his hands on that football. Tell you what, Mr. Smith has got a pretty strong arm, Barry, because there's been a lot of balls that uh, have hit receivers in the hands. It's just been too hot to handle. Joe Smith started at quarterback during his sophomore season. Same trips formation to the right. Give off to Duvall. 
Nice play inside Kyle Johnson, the six foot, 215 pound junior. Makes the tackle. It's going to be at the line of scrimmage. Bring up a third and 10. No gain on the play for Duvall. Sometimes defenses start taking it personally when you start running up and down the field on them, partner. And look like they had a little, little mean streak in the Lewis Palmer defensive line on that one. Some size inside on the line for Coronado at the guards. The guard go 275 and 280. This one out in the flats to Michi at the 25 will be a little too far out in front. Bring up fourth and 10 from the 35 for Coronado. I think you're almost in no man's land here, uh, but I think you go, partner, because your defense has played so well tonight that I think if you take the chance of going on fourth and 10 here, that it's not that big of a risk. Joe Smith gets the decision and heads back in. Trips to the right. Joe Smith rolls this way. Now finds the lane, tucks it up, flag on the play. But a nice open field tackle by Oscar Lagerson, the 6'2 junior. Playing the Holding nose. number 58 on the offense. Penalties decline. First down, First Lewis. down Lewis Palmer. Yeah. So Coronado gambles and loses in that case, and that gives the Rangers great field position at the 36. It will go as a tackle for loss mm -hmm. for Oscar Largeson. And that's one of those when the official throws the flag, doesn't even bother to ask the coach what they want because they know what they're going to ask for. They, they want the foot though, so you just go ahead and say they're going to decline it. Two receivers to the left this time as Tillotson has it underneath. Give it to Brines right off the left-hand side. Tackle made there for Coronado by Bo Beatty. Mm -hmm. It'll be a gain of four on the play, bring up second and six. Now spread formation. Five-man front and then the give off to Bynes. And there is Beatty again, crashing in to make the tackle. Beatty playing in the place of Gabe Portillo tonight. That is going to bring up third and six for the Rangers. Two receivers to the right this time. Man in motion, Tillotson is in trouble. Ends in keeping it right up the middle. He'll be tackled at the 45 yard line, a yard short. So fourth and one upcoming for the Rangers. And no, no hesitation for Tony Romano on that far sideline. No, no need to uh, hesitate at all on this part because if you go for it here on short yardage. Mm -hmm. You can't pick up one yard and uh, you got more issues than you realize. <laughs> Coronado loads eight into the box on this fourth and one, five-man front. And Tillotson trying to draw the Cougars off sides, has to burn the timeout to avoid the penalty. And now looks like the punt team will come on as trotting on for the Rangers is Chorney. Well, a little surprised at this, to be honest with you. With only two minutes and some seconds left in this uh, half, partner, uh, maybe the thinking on the coaching staff is why, why give them the ball in that area with just uh, – Two minutes left. Let's just punt it down and go into the locker room uh, down seven as opposed to the possibility of being down 14 if we give them great field position. And I can't argue with that logic. Michi Personally, does. I would have went. Michi with the 69-yard return for a touchdown. Antoine Outlaw, the receiver that was hurt for the Cougars and lost for the year, has an 89-yarder for a touchdown. Mm. So the Cougars special teams... No stranger to the end zone in this 2013 season. And that's where the gamble on fourth and one 
if you don't get it, you give them the ball on your side of the field. If you kick it away and Michi has a good return, you've either given up a touchdown or really good field position. Exactly, and that's, that's the issue. But Chorney has been able to kick it away and then get a roll that comes back into the middle of the field, mm -hmm. kind of like drawing a nice drive on the par fives. Mm -hmm. Tillotson running around. Now he'll set as the up man. Chorney very calm and calculated. This one is going to skip out of bounds at the 14-yard line. So a good kick by Chorney as it goes for 41-yard line or 41 yards and pins Coronado back at the 14-yard line. 2:13 left to go. Barry Junior York is heading for the uh, locker room. We'll uh, try to get an update for you when we go down to the field for our halftime uh, interview. Uh, I know they took the pads off him, so it uh, doesn't look good for his return at this point, but we'll, we'll find out for sure once uh, Katie and I go down to the field. And we're going to put her to work doing some investigative reporting. Duvall in the eye, takes it off the left-hand side, and he is going to be swarmed under. Good surge from the defensive line. Kyle Johnson in the vicinity. Logison and Wyman collapsing. Clock inside of two minutes. Second and ten for the Cougars. They went to the power eye formation when they were pinned into their goal line. This time it's just the offset eye. And we've got a flag as the handoff comes to the first man through for the Cougars. Before the play, false start, number one on the offense, five-yard penalty, repeat second down. Nike Sumler with the motion infraction, going to move Coronado back inside the 10 now. 132 left to go on the clock. Lone back in a big seam. Nice cutback for Duvall. Off to the races and out in front. This one's going to be a 91-yard touchdown for the Coronado Cougars. As Duvall takes it, finds a seam and takes it to the house. Cougars lead 13 to nothing with 102 left to go. Take a look at this huge opening that he got from his offensive line. Made a move around Tim's. And then it was off to the races. Extra point up and good. No penalty this time. And just like that, the, Cougar, the Coronado Cougars show their big play strike capability. 91-yard touchdown following the motion penalty. Isaiah Duval. Duval, the second leading rusher in the state of Colorado at the 3A classification, adds to his total. He came in with 100 or with 721 yards, and we had him for 11 carries for 80 yards. And flags fly, Coronado offsides on the kickoff. So they will back up five and do it again. Coachman, Coronado, five-yard penalty. And a script kick taken by Chorney, and Chorney is 
belted down at the 41-yard line. Just under one minute remain, 58 seconds, and Lewis Palmer will take over at the 41-yard line. LP will start at the 42, so good field position. If Tillotson can put something together, the 6-1 sophomore is thrown for 270 yards on the year. Or check that, that was his rushing totals. 400 yards on the year. This time he is going to hand it off around the right-hand side. And Austin Michi runs Cody Anderson out of bounds. After Anderson gains three, now they'll mark it at the 49 or 46. Gain of four, be second and six. Trips to the right. Tillotson under center. And a delayed give off. Great call. Great. Great game going to be Charlie Young, the 6 1 senior. And Young will race ahead down to the 39-yard line. Inside of 20 seconds, Tillotson back on the left flat, and that one's going to be incomplete. Pass intended out there for Jonathan Scott, the 6'2 sophomore wide receiver. And that stops the clock with 15.2 seconds to go. Coronado on blackout night. Black pants, black jerseys with the yellow accents and the yellow numerals. Looking to hold this shutout through the first half. Tillotson back under a little bit of pressure. Throws over the middle for Scott and Scott hauls it in at the 13 yard line. Leaping catch by Jonathan Scott. Sophomore came in with 16 receptions for 240 yards and a couple of touchdowns. That's going to move the chains inside of 10 seconds. They spot the ball at the 11. First and 10 from there, Tillotson. And he's going to spike it there to stop the clock with seven seconds. Lewis Palmer still two timeouts. But they trail by 14, trying to take advantage of this good field position and get a score in before halftime. Seven seconds time for one long play or a couple quick ones. The run Brian's out of the formation, bringing in Brian Timms. And they'll split three to the right and send Scott by himself to the left. And it's gonna be a reverse. Well sniffed out by the Cougars and out of bounds. With the tackle, that is Zeb Foster. On the carry is Cody Anderson. For Lewis Palmer, Anderson going to gain just a yard. But we are down to one second on the clock. So we've got a timeout, Lewis Palmer. And Tony Romano will try to dial up one play here for his offense so they don't waste this golden opportunity at the 10-yard line. This will be the last play of the half. Coming up at the half, we will have another part of my sit-down with the twin connection, Sam and Joa Smith. There you see the Lewis Palmer sideline. And of course, we will have the halftime interview before we roll the video. Binds in motion, gonna pitch it to the right, sweep that way, and Coronado with great flow stops Binds in his tracks at the 10-yard line, no gain on the play. And that will be the halftime with the Cougars. They got it started late, but they scored on two of their last three possessions. 
They went 99 yards on a drive cat by Austin Michi from nine yards out. And then it was two plays for Isaiah Duval. One was a penalty, the next one was a Duval. 91 yard sprint up the middle against Lewis Palmer for the 14 to nothing lead. Bob Lizarraga making his way over to, say, to Kate Zakella. And we are ready for our coach's interview. Let's throw it down to the field. Kate, take it away. Coach, so far tonight, this game has been a defensive struggle. Where has the offense been tonight? Uh, the offense is trying to get through the scheme that we practiced all week. It started to click into place. It took a little bit of getting used to what their defense was doing. So second half, we should have, have a little bit better uh, running uh, offensive scheme. Speaking of defense, your defensive line has done well in limiting the Rangers' rushing game tonight. Yeah, fortunately, our defense has been key all season, and they're continuing to do that in this game. Uh, we appreciate everything these young men have worked hard to do, and it's starting to show on the field. Thank you, Coach. Good luck in the second half. Back to you, Barry. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, now a little bit more with my sit-down with Sam and Joe Smith. Guys, it'll be video three in the truck. The Twins Connection. Um, in a way, yes. I mean, some, some games I'll actually I'll say, hey, that linebacker's blitzing, you know, this, this would be there. We kind of talk when we're off the field, like, you know, he's blitzing, you know, hit me here. That would probably work well. We talked to Coach about it. And then um, a couple games back, we actually had an audible where if a linebacker was blitzing, it was just kind of a pass to me or whatever. And so we would call that out, um, and then we'd work that way. So is there any kind of Wonder Twins connection to where there's a glance and a nod now to where, like you just said, you become the hot route, route in a certain situation? Um, sometimes. I, um, I would say absolutely to that because me and Sam, I feel like we can sort of read each other's minds a lot of the time. Not actually, but just the things that he does would be exactly the things that I would do, like some adjustments that he makes to his route that aren't necessarily scripted. That I, I know what he's going to do pretty much, or I, I see it right away, and it's a lot easier. So it's real, it's real a good thing to have when he can adjust, and I can, I can pretty much know what he's doing. I, I, I understand what he's doing.
What did we learn here? The mission of the Grand Friends Program is to place senior citizen and retired volunteers from our community into district classrooms. With this program, District 11 strives to unite two very important segments of our community, our elders and our youth. Now that my children are married and living too far away, I'm not really that involved with my own grandchildren. So this is just something I've always been interested in and helping out in the schools. It's also helped keep me in touch with what's going on in the schools. Uh, I've developed an enormous admiration for school teachers. And I think we, we ask our school teachers to do an awful lot. Uh, and we don't always recognize how well they do at it. And anything that you can do from a volunteer perspective and working with children, that's huge. I look at our grand friends as being priceless and our most valuable resources in schools. The wisdom and experiences of our past and the creativity and energy of our future come together to improve the academic achievement of our young people. Grand Friends volunteers are an integral part of the educational team, preparing every student for a world yet to be imagined. We encourage retired and senior citizens with all kinds of backgrounds to serve as talented mentors to our students. The students benefit not only from the Grand Friends knowledge, but also from the relationships they develop with the Grand Friends. I have a whole lot of experience and by sitting down with these kids and working one-on-one -on -one and we're doing different lessons, I can sometimes interject certain things about my background and my travel to give these kids a little more knowledge than a normal classroom teacher is able to do. The Grand Friends that I've had are sometimes former educators, sometimes not. Um, one of mine's been an engineer, so they come from different walks of life. And they bring enthusiasm to the students, enthusiasm for their learning, and they collaborate together in a very positive way. But they stay on their mission, they stay on focus on whatever it is their objectives or learning objectives are. I would say that um, the impact they can have, you don't know until you get into the classroom. Um, it's your life experience that the students are so uh, wanting to hear and it, and it comes even better I think from someone who wasn't in the education field because the students have been fed with that their whole lives that it's nice to hear from someone who wasn't in the education field and and can kind of give some of that life experience and give let the children see these options that they have when they grow up and it, their attention um, you know is more focused when when we have the grand friends in there I think it's something that's very valuable to the students that the grand friends realize as soon as they step in the classroom. Because many of the kids I work with are kids who either have been told or have decided that they can't do math. Uh, they don't have much confidence in their ability to handle it. And if I can build up some confidence in them, if I can show them that somebody really does care about whether or not they succeed or fail, uh, and get them some individual attention, I think that uh, that seems to help. You will find grand friends in our schools assisting students with literacy, writing, math, and science skills in all grade levels from elementary to adult education. Grand friends also help in libraries and with clerical work to provide assistance to teachers and staff. And I'm a classroom volunteer. I, when the kids are working on a worksheet or trying to do their homework, I'm available to help them along with the teacher in the room. And I think that's, that's useful because uh, these kids are the kids who really need the most individual attention. Uh, they need to have people who are willing to help and show interest in having them improve. And so uh, having, having a grand friend and someone, someone they can talk to is very helpful. Teachers, principals, and school staff continually praise the addition of grand friends to their schools. In the classroom, Teachers lean on the grand friends for many tasks. I, um, as a teacher, have hours and hours of work I need to do for one-on-one -on -one assessments with students. And when the grand friends can step in and assume that role, it gives me additional time for instruction with those students so I can see greater growth. I have a lot of kids who are homeless or in foster care um, and don't have the privilege 
or to be able to have an elderly person in a life and a grand friend can serve that purpose. The children are really receptive to them when they're here. They are there because they really care about children and I do I'm excited that she's going to be with me each week with the students, which at first it was every other week, because she really wanted to develop a relationship and more um, contact with the students. So that's just valuable. You can't, you can't package that. That's something that comes from the heart. And it's not only the students who are enriched by the interaction. Oh, it's, it's just a wonderful experience. If you enjoy children, this is the place to be. Well, this is probably, of all the volunteer work I've done, off and on the most enjoyable thing I've done and I feel good when I leave here because I hope that somehow during the day these kids get maybe a little more one-on-one -on -one or a pat on the back or a little more confidence building that I can give them where the teacher doesn't have that kind of time to do it. I would say Grand Friends is a great place to volunteer. Uh, first of all they have opportunities at all grade levels so what well, you know, wherever you feel that you would be interested in working, they can find a place for you. I would tell prospective volunteers that it can be very rewarding. Uh, it stretches you a little bit, absolutely. It asks you to do some things you probably haven't done before unless you've been a teacher. Uh, but I think the payoffs are very large. So share a lifetime of experience. Make a true difference in a child's life. For more information or to become a grand friend, call the Colorado Springs School District 11 Volunteer Services Department at 520-2202. Colorado Springs School District 11 is preparing every student for a world yet to be imagined through innovative technology offered throughout the district. One of the most efficient uses of technology in District 11 is the wireless access that can be found in any building on any of our campuses. Students and staff may bring their own electronic devices and use the Wi-Fi in all of our 52 school sites and administrative buildings. Students in some schools are offered one-to-one -one personal electronic devices, such as netbooks and laptops, for use both at school and at home. Technology modeled classrooms help high school students connect to the world through use of web-based video teleconference systems. Many of our students take advantage of online classes as we extend learning beyond the walls of the classroom. In District 11, the world is changing. Meet the future. Rangers warming up, ready for the second half action. Coronado leads 14 to nothing in what has really been a tight defensive battle. Coronado went on a 99-yard penalty aided drive and then one big play, 99s for Isaac Duval. Kate has Tony Romano, the head coach of Lewis Palmer, on the field. Let's throw it down to Kate. played well early. What do you think is going to be the key to getting your offense going? 
Well, they, uh, they've really shut it down on the inside there on the run game. And uh, our quarterback can throw. That's not his, uh, you know, he doesn't have as much confidence in that. But we're going to have to come out and throw the ball if we're going to be able to get down the field. How satisfied are you with your defense at this point? Oh, man, they're extremely proud of those guys. They've been really popping and uh, have a really good plan in on them. Maybe caught them sleeping somewhat. I mean, they've got some real weapons with uh, with their running back, so we'll see if we can keep it going for two more quarters. All right, thanks, Coach. Good luck. Back to you, Barry. Thank you very much, Kate. And uh, from the Coronado statistician, 20 carries for the Cougars, 173 yards. Most of that via the Isaiah Duval Express, as we have Duval unofficially for 171 of those 173 yards. And of course, the big one was the 93 yard touchdown with one minute left to go right before half for the Cougars to extend this lead from seven to 14 to nothing. Coronado won the toss in at the beginning of the game. They deferred, so they will take the ball first here in the second half and look to build on this 14 point lead. We'd like to thank Louis Pizza for providing dinner to the student volunteers and production staff bringing you tonight's broadcast. Louis Pizza is a longtime supporter of School District 11. Call one of Louis's five locations to find out more about their straight A program, rewarding students with free pizza for their academic achievements. Our thanks to Louis and all his staff at Louis Pizza for all they do for the students of School District 11. About ready to get it under the way underway. Scott teeing it up for Lewis Palmer. Michi, one of the deep men, and it's going to be a short angle kick that is muffed by the Cougars, but then the second man falls on it at the 37-yard line. We've got a Cougar coming off injured after he went down on the kickoff coverage. And for the Cougars, that looks to be Corbin Bender, the 185-pound senior. We'll have to look at the replay if we can, see if that was Bender that tried to field that ball at first. So the Cougars in business at the 37-yard line. First drive of the second half. Give it off the right-hand side for Michi, and Michi's to the outside and gone. One play, 63 yards, and a touchdown for Coronado. A quick hitter off the right-hand side. And Coronado makes a statement here in the first 11 seconds as they jump on top 20 to nothing. Austin Michi with a huge gain. Watch the left side, right side of your screen, folks. Michi breaks through the line, and right there, if he don't make that tackle, you're not going to catch this young man until he stops running in the end zone. And, and the extra point is up and good. 21-0 in favor of the Cougars. What a way to start. Just after we asked the coach about his defense, and they come out and get a quick hitter like that. Uh, partner? My goodness, I can see now why the running game was so effective against the Mitchell Marauders uh, last week. Runs like that. And, and that is going to put a lot of pressure on this young Lewis Palmer offense, young in the skill positions. And, and what Paul I've, Tillotson, 6'1", sophomore's got some throwing to do. And what I've seen from the offense, Barry, is not a quick strike offense. So I don't think it's one of those offenses that can play from behind very well, but we'll see. Jonathan Scott made a nice catch to get the ball close for Lewis Palmer in the end of the first half there. We'll see if there is more of that Tillotson to Scott connection. Good return here out across the 25 to the 28-yard line. 
Well, there, there better be. That is Christensen with the return. Mills Palmer needs some points, and they need them in a hurry. If the second half goes as quick as the first half did, they're really going to need to step it up. I was going to say, I don't, not sure exactly what actual time it is, but that first half actually flew by. It was quick. Motion is Christensen. Tolleson is going to roll to his left and go nowhere. Down in a heap. With the tackle is Joe, or check that is Isaac Jones, a six foot junior for Coronado. Four man front for the Cougars. Now they shift it down into a five man. Tolleson has to pull it down. He's got room to run, and he will be hit at the 33-yard line. He'll be ahead for a gain of five. But with the tackle for Coronado, that was Joseph Hunt, the senior defensive tackle. 230 pounds of stop. I think what I liked about that play, partner, he's looked downfield. He didn't see anything he liked down there. And instead of forcing that football down the field, he just pulled it down and tried to get what he could out of that play and live to fight another day, so to speak. Third and four. Timson Christensen to the left. Anderson to the right in the formation. Tillotson's going to try to follow Bynes, but Coronado has none of it. It'll be a gain of two, bring up fourth and two from the 36-yard line. His Coronado defense has some size, 6'1", 200 for Melvin Hardy. Joe Hunt is 6'3", two and a quarter. Corbin Bender, 5'11", 185, might be the smallest. I was pretty impressed when I walked into that locker room down there. Fourth down punt formation. Michi and Duval back, standing back at the 35 yard line. And this one is going to sit like a nine iron. Finally, have a little spin to give Lewis Palmer a couple yards extra coverage on the kick. They'll spot it at the 43 yard line. Kick of 20 yards for Nick Chorney. Chorney has gotten some good rolls out of his kicks. Actually pinned Coronado down at the one. Yes, he has. To which Coronado answered with that 99-yard drive. But Coronado in business here at the 43-yard line. Mm -hmm. Father, we put Katie to work at halftime, and she went down to the Coronado locker room and got us an injury update. We'll pass that along in a second. Offset eye, Duval, the deep back. Sam Smith comes across the formation. Give off is to the up man, Zeb Foster. And Foster will be lucky to get back to the line of scrimmage. Oh, lost a couple, I thought. Back to the 42, they'll mark it a loss of one. So it'll bring second and 11. Michi checks back into the backfield for Coronado with Colton Nixon, the sophomore. Mm -hmm. Duvall out to the sidelines, and they're going to... One of the coaches wanted him to go to the bench, but he waved him off. Coronado, 7-0, and, oh, and here's a give off to Michi off the left-hand side. This time he's got the corner. Oscar Michi steps out of bounds at the... 18-yard line. He stepped out. He sure did. Cut it back in, but stepped out at the 19-yard line. Play goes for 38 yards right. and a Coronado first down. Good blocking by the Cougars. It might have been a little holding there, actually. But it, once he uh, hit that corner, he showed great quickness. It wasn't speed. It was quickness to get outside. And then he tried to cut back in, but uh, that back foot hit that line. 38 yards later, he was putting the Cougars in good shape. 
Duvall back in, and he'll follow, he'll follow Foster right up the middle. Blowing that play up was Christian Abatello, the 6'1 senior for Lewis Palmer. Read it all the way, stepped up in the hole. It'll be second and 10 from the 19 for Coronado. Cougars have 200 yard rushes right now, partner. Duvall and Michi. Duvall starts right, but he will be forced back. Good pressure on the outside by Lewis Palmer. Abatello in there once again, getting a little help from Logison. So it will be third and 10 at the 19. Duvall coming off a little gingerly for the Cougars. Yeah, I think he's more tired than anything else. I don't think that's an injury. Such a big component coming into the game. Had, a hundred, or had 721 yards. Has 170 tonight. This ball intended in the far corner. And we're going to have a roughing the quarterback penalty on Lewis Palmer. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. As Joe Smith gets up. But that'll be another first down by penalty for the Cougars. George Dimitri. Personal foul. Ball. Roughing the passer. Number 33 on the defense. Half the distance. Richard Ito, the linebacker, getting there a little bit late. Joe Smith throwing for his brother in the corner of the end zone. Just what you didn't need if you're the Lewis Palmer Rangers partner is to get that kind of a penalty. Yeah. Got to maintain your discipline when you get in on that quarterback. Beachy in at the tailback. Zoe Smith, Smith keeps it around the right-hand side. And Joe is going to be down to the one-yard line. Pickup of nine is going to be second and goal from the one. Watch thought he had a little trouble with the snap here. We'll have to see it on the replay. I, I thought he was that was a, a, a fake all the way. As you can see, there were no runners uh, uh, coming toward him. That was a design play to roll him out and see what he can pick up. And touchdown, Coronado. 6.46 left to go. Joe Smith said, I didn't get it on the last one. I'll just take it in now on the quarterback sneak. And just quarterback keeper to the right-hand side. And for Joe Smith, that is the sixth touchdown rushing. Extra point up and good. And Coronado, two scores in the first half, two here as they've really cranked it up. Two possessions, two touchdowns. Joe Smith from a yard out. And Coronado leads 28 to nothing in their bid to start the season 8 and 0. The seven game win streak to start this season school is a school record. The last, their last loss was in a week 10 battle with Discovery Canyon that would have given them a share of the league title with Lewis Palmer and Discovery Canyon. But that wild game ended with uh, Alex Wirtz outplaying Joe Smith and the Cougars getting a little bit of help from his defense on a sack fumble strip to end the game did the, the thunder as Coronado was moving down the field with under a minute remaining. But this year, a totally different story. Discovery Canyon is going to try to improve to 7-1 and one this weekend, trying to keep up with Coronado. Deep angle kick comes down to Tim's at the 13. Into the wall. And Timms will be knocked down at the 28-yard line. In on the tackle, number 88, that is Aaron Shoemaker, one of the former Wasson Thunderbirds that has found a new home. And Shoemaker found it here with Coronado. And he will stay in the game as Bob Lizarraga is starting to empty his bench a little bit with a 28-point lead here. 6.40 to go in the third quarter. 
Tillotson with the delayed give. Out to the 30, it'll be a gain of two for the for the big fullback for Lewis Palmer. That is Charlie Young, the freshman. Both teams will start getting some of their second play, second line players into the game. Give them a little bit of varsity experience. Young stays in the backfield as a long back Tillotson throwing down for Scott. Good coverage down there for Coronado. That is the normal corner where Junior York would be roaming. And again, I'm having trouble seeing the number on that all-black jersey oh of the boy. Cougars. Yeah, that's, that's, that's tough. I think that is Brian Torres, the 160-pound 5'8 sophomore. Speaking of York, number 18. Giving an injury update on York here at the display. Tillotson back the underneath route. Breaks one tackle. And then the second tackle is made for the Cougars by Devin Baker, the 5'10 junior. First down for Lewis Palmer. Palmer's run this play a couple of times tonight, but I just they, they send one receiver out, and then they send another one up underneath that pattern, and it's been open pretty much all night. There's a missed tackle right there that would have held that play to less yardage than it actually gained. But they've run that play quite effectively a couple of times tonight. Trying to slip the receiver underneath the linebackers. Tillotson with the keeper, and he will be brought down on the play. Joe Hunt, the senior, with an, a little bit of help there by Baker. But you know, Coronado's a story. We had three of the four local news channels out here today before the game. That's where they should be. Ooh. Over the middle and a well-timed hit. Austin Michi in coverage. And now we've got a late flag flying back at the line of scrimmage. Might be rough in the pass. We'll have to go to George Demetrio for the call. Personal foul, roughing the passer, number 54. Let's see if we stay on the end of this play here. And yeah, anytime and down at the knees. Go down to the knees like that. Uh, that flag's going to come out. Also got a, I also got a clarification on the uh, fair catch signal penalty that we talked about earlier. I'll give you that uh, uh, later too. But uh, Junior York partner uh, is, uh, has a upper body injury. Could come back, but probably won't. No need with a 28-point lead as it stands right now. Tillotson straight up the middle to Charlie Young. And Young will bowl those his way down to the 35 for a gain of three. And it'll bring up second and seven. As you see Devin Baker there for the Cougars who has come in to take the place of Junior York. I've talked to Dave Howard about these uniforms, partner. They, they look good, but for, for us, it's, it's not a good thing. Two receivers to the right, option left, and Baker is going to get swarmed under. It'll be a loss of two. Michi, the second man there, but blowing that up was Sam Smith. And another tackle for loss. And Coronado has just been in complete control of this running game for Lewis Palmer tonight. And, and the reason why, partner, is that on defense, that defensive line is getting excellent penetration. And once you get penetration into the backfield, it's not necessarily for pass rushing. It's to stop the running game. And brought down after a gain of about four. Bring up fourth down and five for Lewis Palmer. They'll leave the offense on the field and go for it. Tillotson goes over and talks to his head coach. And Why not? Finds the play. Charlie Young's a pretty tough little runner there, partner. He's running in between the tackles, getting a lot of good, tough yards. 
Young with three on the last carry. Now Tillotson with the keeper, and he is going to be swarmed under. He'll pick up two, but not near enough. The Coronado defense holds. Getting up off the bottom of the pile was Bo Beatty, the defensive lineman, who was not one of the earlier week starters. He is starting in the place of Gabe Portillo, the 215-pound junior, who was a game-time scratch tonight. So Coronado takes over, 3-11 left in the third, already up 28 to nothing. Third time tonight that Lewis Palmer has turned it over on downs. And flag flies on the far sideline and finding it tough to run straight up the middle is Joe Smith on the keeper. Interesting too what this call is going to be. Sideline warning, Lewis Palmer. Ooh. So just a warning. Really, uh, someone on the coaching staff probably had a difference of opinion about where they should go for dinner tonight and voiced his opinion. Smith and Michi split out to the bottom of your screen. This is Michi in the open field. Nice move. Makes an inside move and gets out across the 40. He's going to be shy of the fourth or the first down. And it will be second and about one here after the pitch and catch. Nice pass out in the flat. Now watch this move right here, folks. Nope. Going east. Nope. I'm going west. <laughs> Little swim move on Jonathan Scott. Got ahead for a couple more after the missed tackle. Michi has gotten the load of the work carrying the ball here in the second half. Duval was a little bit shaken up. So Foster went in motion to give for the keeper. Joe Smith got just enough, got two out to the 42. First down, Coronado. Weapons, depth, and experience for this Coronado team. Three yeah. words that come to mind now. They will be a tough out in the uh, playoffs. I, I'm going to go ahead and call it that they're going to be in the playoffs. I think at 7-0 uh, right now and probably 8-0 after tonight, I think that's a pretty safe call. Uh, but they will be a tough team to deal with. Pitch to Michi around the right-hand side. Michi breaks a couple tackles and down the sideline once again. Finally nudged out of bounds by Tyler Geske. The Five, 850 pound senior. Jason Michi around first down Coronado at the 44. Watch him coming out. Oops, wrong side. <laughs> coming this way. And he'll hit that corner. And then he'll get by on the corner there. This part heading up field. Slot to the left. Delayed give off. And not much there. Geske comes up on the tackle of Zeb Foster. Give him a gain of one, bring up second and nine. Next week for Coronado, it is Woodland Park. And that'll be up there or down here? I believe that's going to be up there. Mm -hmm. But then the big one, week 10 against Discovery Canyon at District 20 Stadium. That, should that be could a, be for the South Central League title. That should be a good one. Stack Sam Smith to the left, rolling him out this way. He finds an open scene, and his brother finds him. Down to the 31-yard line. That is going to be a pitch and catch of 12 and a first down. <laughs> Joe Smith rolling to the left. Sam Smith going down, just settling into an open area. These two young men very confident, very focused in what they want to do. Smith, the leading tack Sam Smith, the leading tackler on the defense, as well as being an offensive threat. Zeb Foster, the second man through, breaks a tackle. He'll be inside the 20-yard line. 
Now Coronado with 20 seconds left to go in the third, just imposing its will yeah. on Lewis Palmer. Watch this side of your screen, folks. There's a nice little crease open up there. He'll get through it. Get ahead for six yards. Colton Nixon, the sophomore, with a good block, sealing a cut back lane. And that is the end of the third quarter here from Gary Berry Stadium. All Cougars all night long as they look to improve to 8-0 and on the year. And they are in good position with just 12 minutes left in this ball game as you take a look at the Lewis Palmer Rangers. If you'd like to own a copy of this or any of the exciting action we bring you here on the District 11 channel, three ways to do it. By email at channel16 at d11.org. By phone at 520-2269. Or you can order online. Go to d11.org. In the bottom of the home page in the quick link section is D11 on TV. On the upper left-hand side, you will see the uh, tab for the order form, also the tab for the web streaming and the schedule, so you can see when it will be replayed on Channel 16, but also streamed, more importantly, on the District 11 website. Some of the crowd that have made their way down in black and orange from Lewis Palmer, top of the hill. Probably a little warmer here tonight as this front's coming through than it would be if they were sitting up... Uh, uh, at the stadium at Monument. I guarantee you it's warmer down here than it is up there. This is Zeb Foster, the second man through. And he'll keep driving his legs inside the 20-yard line. That should be enough for another Coronado first down on a pickup of five. So in this set, Foster is shifted to the fullback position and Colt Nixon, the sophomore, playing fullback. And they are moving the chains once again. Very good night for the Cougars as far as the rushing game goes. Almost uh, 300 yards of uh, rushing offense tonight. 330 on the ground against Mitchell last week and a 50-6 to six victory. Foster shows the ability to bounce it outside, cuts it back in. We've got a flag well behind the play coming over to make the tackle. For Lewis Palmer is Brad Ellis, the 6'2 junior at the 11, but holding Coronado is going to bring this one back. Mm -hmm. and nice job by Foster to rip off 10 yards, showing a little bounce to the outside. Yeah, he said, no, I'm not uh, just an inside runner, no. I can bounce this thing out if they let me uh, go out there once in a while, do a little business out there. Foster does have five touchdowns on the year. His long run is 22, 33 carries, 171 yards coming into the night. But I did have a chance to talk to George Demetrio at halftime, and the, the only thing uh, about that fair catch signal play that we talked about. They don't have to give the fair catch signal. The, the defense does have to give them an opportunity to make a play. Zoe Smith back, firing down the center. Trip, tripping up, but no call. The intended receiver was Devin Baker, the junior. And, and I think a good no call on that one. I don't know if we've got a replay. Let's take a look at that again. I think a good no call on it. Bob Lizarraga gets the explanation and is happy with it. Now watch the center of your screen, folks. See right there. See, I don't. I never saw the two feet come together. I think he stopped and tried to reverse himself to catch the football, and it just looked bad from the vantage point that the fans had, but it wasn't a bad play at all. Second and 20. Joe Smith picks the ball off the dirt. The snap becoming a little bit of a problem for Coronado now. He finds Baker for a gain of six. Out in the right. So now it will be third and 14. Coronado needs to get to the 10. Inside the 10 for the first down. See what they draw up here on third and 14. Foster the lone back. Receiver left. Bunch trips to the right. Here comes pressure. And this Joe Smith has to unload it early. As coming in on the blitz was Richard Ito. And that's going to be over the head of Zeb Foster. And incomplete. So now fourth and 14 from the 24-yard line would be a 41-yard field goal. 
The offense on the field for Coronado. Yeah, I don't even think they're considering it. Both of these teams have pretty good kicking games. Mm -hmm. Not much win tonight either. Old Glory Especially is with laying Mason limp. Lander for the Cougars. Mm -hmm. Old Glory is laying limp, so no win tonight. Three receivers left. Joe Smith throwing to the right for his brother. Oh, oh gets the toes down at the three. No, no incomplete. He dropped that. it. He could not complete the catch. What an effort by Sam Smith. Oh, my. Would have been a big play in a conversion on third and 14. And now a flag on the Coronado sidelines. Bob Lizarraga getting an explanation now you see in the center of your screen. George Demetrio will walk over now and you have a chat with the Cougar head man. Don't know if we have a chance to look at that on replay. But. <laughs> the Coronado fans are saying, hey, that was a catch down there. Uh, I think if they uh, didn't look with a fan's eye, they may have seen it. Uh, actually, that wasn't as clean a catch as they thought it was. Bob Lizarraga. Still trying to digest the explanation he is getting. Mm -hmm. And I think the explanation is on the flag and not necessarily on the play. I, I think everybody's okay with the play. I think he's uh, explaining to him what the uh, flag was thrown for. And whatever... Dead ball, unsportsmanlike conduct on the Coronado coaching staff. 15-yard penalty, first and 10 for Lewis Palmer. There's a call that people will appreciate. Well, let's watch the replay here, partner, replay. and let's see if he actually made this catch here. Right here, let's see. Where's catch, the catch, feet. No, see the ball came and out. the ball came out, so see the ball come he out. did not. I, I thought my eyes had deceived yeah. me a no. little bit. No. So... Whether he got the toe in or not, and that's it didn't matter because there it is right there. Yeah, angle. yeah. The ball hit the ground. Yeah. Good call by the officials. Oh, they always do that. Tillotson out to the right hand side finds Christensen, and Christensen is going to be kept to a short gain. Shoemaker and Foster in the vicinity on the tackle. It will be just a game of three, second and seven. 10 17 left to go. Christensen losing his helmet <laughs> on the play. Oh, he's a tough guy. He, he will need a fun. Four man front for the Cougars now as they face a spread offense. Delayed give off. And getting grabbed by the shirt collar and pulled to the ground is Charlie Young. So Young getting the bulk of the carries here in place of Matt Brines. So there, Tony Romano is calling on the six 185 pound freshman. Mm -hmm. I like what I'm seeing of that young man too, where he's, he's, he's putting his nose in there and he's not afraid to take a lick. The ball the nose of the ball rests on the southern side of the 40 or 49 yard line. They need the north side of the 49 yard line for the first down. And Young will be ahead off the right hand side. Smith shot the gap but missed the running back as it was just a little bit to his left. First down, Lewis Palmer. Yeah, getting up there is one thing, but getting them to the ground, that's quite another. Next week, we have had a programming change. We will not be bringing you the Palmer Valor Christian battle. Instead, we will be bringing you volleyball, mm -hmm. Doherty versus Liberty from Sparta. Straight up, T 
to Young, and Young is going to be driven back. With the big hit is the big senior, Joe Hunt. Stands him up at the line, no gain. It will be second and ten. <laughs> Hunt said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little tired of seeing you running up the middle here and uh, having your way, so we're going to have our way with you on this play. Our next football action will be in two weeks when we bring you the Doherty Spartans and the Palmer Terrors. That's regular this season. Crosstown too. rivalry, week nine action. Doherty has Valor Christian this week. And then Lewis Palmer as this pass is incomplete. Intended down the seam to an open Cody Anderson. But the senior unable to make the catch. Now watch uh, right down the middle of the screen, folks. Nice setup, nice throw, but he threw it a little behind him. And he had to turn around to try to make the catch and just couldn't get everything turned around and coordinated in time. Scott split out with Christensen to the left side of the formation. They're going to go for the home run ball. In coverage is Baker, and Baker's going to draw the flag head inside position. Well, they're going to talk about it. Incomplete pass. I think they're going to talk about it uh, to see if uh, the ball was A, catchable, or if it really was interference. And I think eh, you, might, you might see this one picked up. You might. Conversation to talk with George Demetrio now. No, he's going to call it. Pass interference, defense, number 18, 15 yard penalty, results in the first down. Now, a case that can was Brian be. Brian Torres, the sophomore in coverage. Mm -hmm. A case can be made for pass interference as I was watching that play develop. There was a little bit of. Contact by the defender. Now the Cougars on the field and on the sideline spurring on this home crowd down below us to make a little noise. Oh, Tillotson with that underneath, and it is broken up. Zeb Foster on the defense. Abatello, the six foot senior, Christian Abatello, unable to make the catch. Good coverage by Foster. 8.05 on the clock here in the fourth quarter. All Coronado, 28 to nothing, pitching the shutout. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want a shutout. They, they, don't, they don't want to let uh, Lewis Palmer into the end zone. So you'll watch this defense. They'll be fighting. Spread formation for Tillotson as he slips under center. Here comes the bull rush, and he's able to get it away. Smith with the tackle. It's going to be a short gain of just two. Third and eight with the completion. But Tillotson to be able to get it away. And that, that uh, the last completion there, partner, I'm trying to see uh, to Mr. Timms. Short yardage. Trying to, trying to think of what we would call this in hockey. Rhines comes in motion. Tillotson looks to the left. It's nice. a slant to Scott, and Scott is ahead down to the 16-yard line. Play is good for 16 and a first down for Lewis Palmer. Nice throw, nice catch. And, I, and my hockey aficionado in the truck has told me that uh, I may have uh, jinxed the Cougars here by mentioning that word uh, shutout. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I think the Coronado defense will bail me out. Scott split to the left. That is Brian's in motion. We are going to have a timeout called by the Coronado Cougars. Their first here in the second half. Mm -hmm. As the defensive coordinator wants a word with his troops as they try to preserve this shutout, we'll say it once again. Coronado looking to improve to 8 and 0 on the season. 1997, they were 8 and 2 and missed the postseason. And then back in 
1991, they were 10-3 and 1 when it all ended up, and they were the state runners-up. Mm. Those the other two best seasons in Coronado history. This a special season for the Coronado Cougars. Seven straight wins after the loss in Week 10 last year to Discovery Canyon. And this group of seniors for the Cougars were freshmen when the varsity went 0-10, the last winless season for the Cougars just four seasons ago. So some work that they have done, commitment that they have made over the last four years, and it is paying off in spades, as they say. We'll give uh, Dave Howard, the athletic director, Bob Lizarraga, and his coaching staff an awful lot of credit, partner, because we've seen Coronado for the past four years, and, and we, we've seen the improvement in this program and the players that are playing in it. The numbers that have come out for football. Mm -hmm. Pressure from the backside. Tillotson's able to get it away, but it'll one-hop into Anderson. Or into Christensen, my apologies. That was because of the pressure. So it will be second and 10. So whatever was dialed up was good for the Coronado defense during that timeout. Mm -hmm. I got faith in the Coronado defense. Barry, they're going to they're gonna bail me out of this one. <laughs> they're going to preserve this shutout. <laughs> Jonathan Scott has had some nice receptions tonight on some big plays. It's interesting that they haven't tried to funnel a little bit more of this offense into his hands. Yeah, he's, he's been very effective on those slants in particular. Ooh, Christensen ooh. and Young earn Scott to the left, and this one is going to be stopped before it gets started. Motion against the Rangers. The slot receiver got a little antsy. And, of course, when it comes to 4A volleyball, the Lewis Palmer Lady Rangers leading the Pikes Peak Athletic Conference. Yeah, they do. A game well. ahead of defending champion Cheyenne Mountain as they continue to do battle. Mm-hmm. And I believe it's the 15th of October that they will meet down at Cheyenne Mountain High School to decide that side of the bracket. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, the 4A Colorado Springs Metro, mm -hmm. Coronado has a game against Mitchell last night, which was a win, and uh, Mesa Ridge, and I can't remember who the other. Let me pull the pregame script up, and I can find out. But the Lady Cougars doing very well. Tolleson tries to step through a seam on the right-hand side, and he will be brought down. In the general vicinity, Isaac Jones, the junior, and just for the Cougars. A good pass rush by the Cougars. Watch, they get up here, and then right here, they get another guy in there who brings it down from behind to make that tackle. But that, that's because of a good pass rush that the Cougar defensive line generated. Coronado will take on Woodland Park, who they defeated just the other night. On Tuesday night, yes, now here's a wide receiver screen to Scott, and he worked around one tackler, but Sam Smith there to bring him down at the 17. Pick up on the play of the five they lost on the penalty, and it is going to be fourth and 10 for Lewis Palmer from the 17-yard line. All right, come on, Cougars. Are they going to kick this? Yeah, they're going to try to kick a field goal here. This is going to be Tristan Girk, the 5'8", 126-pound sophomore. Mm -hmm. Got a pretty good leg. Spot is the 24. It's a 34-yard kick partially blocked by the Cougars. <laughs> and the shutout is preserved. 5'14 <laughs> left to go. The block field goal by the Cougars. Way to go, Cougars. And as I'm looking through the statistics, that is the second block field goal for the Cougars. Junior York with the other one. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see who got a hand on it for the Cougars. I did not either. The offense goes back to work now. They take it over at the 20-yard line. Joe Smith still in the game. Gives it straight up the middle. Nothing doing. Heart of this Lewis Palmer defense. Loggison, Wyman, and Johnson helping to stuff that. No 
little gain from Michi on the play. But time ticking away on the Rangers, trailing by 28. Mm -hmm. Smith in motion, resets to the left side. Keeper for Joa Smith, turns it back into the middle. Good run, he'll be ahead for seven. Bring up a third and three for the Cougars as this offense continues to churn. Now we've only got one more football game scheduled this year, partner, but if we get to televise Coronado again, that'll be a good thing because that means it'll be a playoff it'll game. It'll be a playoff game. They and the Doherty Spartans as well. And, Doherty mm -hmm. with a very tough task this weekend, traveling to Valor Christian. Play that and then the week team. after that, uh, uh, when you and I are off, we might have to end up down at Fountain Fort Carson. Oh. Guy Berrickman Stadium to watch Doherty and Fountain Fort Carson. Option keeper around this side for Joe Smith. Double hands the ball. Keeps his legs churning. He's all the way out to the 44-yard line. It is a pickup on the play of 17. And we have an injured player on the field. That is Christensen for Lewis Palmer. Slow to get up. Watch the come around the right side of your screen here, folks. Watch him coming around. And all he wants to do is get the first down and keep the clock alive. But uh, Lewis Palmer did not tackle very well on that play. So uh, he said, why not? I'll just go ahead and get a couple extra yards out of this thing, get this first down. And Joe Smith with the keeper gets 17 yards. And I had a chance to talk with Sam and Joe Smith earlier. Guys, if we can run video two, uh, this is Joe Smith on uh, his coaching staff helping them helping him to turn into the leader for this Coronado team on the offense. Mm -hmm. Well, I think a lot, of, a lot of it has been the way that my coaches have helped me to become a leader. I mean, through those three years that I was quarterback, um, I've had a lot, of, a lot of help just from a head coach trying to like, help me become a leader. I'm really comfortable. I think the that our offensive coordinator really knows exactly what he's doing, exactly where he wants the ball to go. And he's a, he's a real smart guy, so I totally trust him, and everything he's trying to do is, is awesome. Now, there's a young man who knows uh, where his bread is buttered. Yeah. <laughs> you, you trust your offensive coordinator. Even if you don't, you say it. <laughs> but I, but I, I really do believe he was sincere in that. But that's a good lesson, though, uh, partner. When you get a good coaching staff, help your coaches out. By believing in them, having faith in them, and even if you don't understand it as a player, just do what the coaches ask you to do because they did a lot of studying and they know a little bit about the game and, uh, and they'll help you become a better player. Senior Nick Christensen getting up on his own power, a great sign for the Rangers. Always. When you walk off, that's always a good thing. Getting a hand from the Coronado side and his own bench as he makes his way over that way. Coronado to the line. Michi, the deep man in the set. Zeb Foster at the fullback. 341 for the Cougars to improve to 8 and 0. Give to Zeb Foster. Bounces, bounces off the initial hit. He's ahead for five, just shy of midfield. And this running game is just ticking away this clock, taking any life out of Lewis Palmer all night long. Well, when you can control the ball running. And I was on the field before the game, and uh, one of the officials uh, said, uh, Cornell's got a pretty good running game, which means uh, this might be a fast one. And he's turning into be a, a very prophetic man right now. Michi with 122 yards. Duval with 170 yards. That's almost 300 between them. Smith has 40. This one's intended for... Got to get the number For there. Torres, Brian Torres streaking down the right side. And that's a number I've been having trouble with because with those jerseys, the 10 and the 18 <laughs> look an awful lot alike. Oh, but that was Torres, Torres, the intended receiver. Yeah, we got to talk to our buddy Dave Howard about these jerseys. <laughs> Third <laughs> and five. Bring back those USC jerseys that we didn't have no problem reading. 
Smith resets to the left. They'll run it that way with Michi. Michi reaches out to the 45-yard line and a first down for the Cougars. But back to my point, Duval with 179 yards. Now Michi with 130. There's your 300. Joe Smith has 40. And if I can get my partner to scroll down on his stat sheet, 20 for Zeb Foster. So there's a 350-yard rushing performance against Lewis Palmer to go with a 333-yard rushing performance for this Coronado offense against the Marauders last week. Oh, I tell you, this is impressive. And we still got 222, and Coronado's got the ball. Add two more. Does this give off the left-hand side is going to be stuffed up? Is that 30, 33? Kyle Johnson, that's Austin Michi with the carry. Kyle Johnson, the 6'4", 